Now I'd like to introduce you to today's featured speaker. Cam Harvey is Professor of Finance at Duke University and Research Associate at NBER. He served as the 2016 President of the American Finance Association. The past four years, he has taught an interdisciplinary course called Innovation and Crypto Ventures that focuses on the mechanics and applications of blockchain technology. More than half of the Duke Fuqua class of 2018 has enrolled in his class. Sam? Thank you very much, um, and it's great uh, to be able to do this webcast. Uh, as, as was mentioned, my course is uh, a rare course at, uh, at Duke University in that it doesn't reside in any particular area. I do finance, I do operations, I do accounting, um, and I touch on a number of uh, topics in marketing. So today, what I'd like to do is to basically go through the links that are available today uh, between this new technology blockchain and marketing. And my agenda is basically very simple. It's in two parts, essentially. I'll, I will go through the blockchain technology um, and give you an idea of what the possibilities are, give you uh, an understanding uh, of blockchain. And then I'll focus uh, very specifically on the impact on marketing. Uh, I want to leave a lot of time for questions because this is the sort of topic that there's a lot of questions on. Uh, indeed, it is a challenge uh, to actually teach this or just to understand it as a researcher. Um, when I got interested in this topic uh, five years ago, there was a lot of work that I had to do to essentially understand what was going on. Um, this is a technology that's heavily um, founded in computer science, and some of the stuff that I will say today will be kind of obvious to you um, if you've got a computer science uh, background, but uh, probably most of us don't have that background. So let me kind of continue and, and go through uh, the basics of blockchain. So the first thing is that there's no the blockchain. So when people talk about the blockchain, it, it doesn't make any sense. It is a technology. There's uh, millions of ways to, to implement that technology. It's just a series of choices that you actually uh, make. Uh, so that, that's one thing. You can talk about the blockchain of a particular uh, implementation like Ethereum, uh, but blockchain is implemented in different ways across uh, different applications. So the first thing I would like you to know is that blockchain was not invented by the founder of, of Bitcoin. So a lot of people make this mistake that they consider Bitcoin and blockchain in the same breath. And it, it turns out that the blockchain idea was invented by Haber and Stornetta in 1991. And it was a technology for them uh, that allowed them to timestamp uh, documents. So it turns out that it hasn't really been used that much, though it was invented in 1991, and it only became popular with the advent of cryptocurrencies. And I will spend a little time talking about cryptocurrencies because they're the first uh, kind of killer application for blockchain technology. The course that I teach, uh, we talk about cryptocurrencies somewhat, but the course is mainly a blockchain course. And I tell my students, even if the current cryptocurrencies go to a value of zero, it doesn't really matter for the course material because blockchain doesn't need cryptocurrency. Um, it is a general technology, as we will see. So that's kind of the first thing. So, so what is uh, blockchain? So it's essentially got four features, and as I said, it really depends on how you implement it, but there's some commonalities. And the first commonality is that it is a ledger. So think like a spreadsheet, ledger. 
uh, but it is distributed. And the, um, the graphic that I'm showing, I've actually pulled from this famous 1964 paper that was one of the foundational papers for the internet. Uh, at the time, the U.S. was very stressed out about a Soviet um, missile attack, essentially taking out their centralized computing. So that was the genesis of having uh, distributed rather than centralized uh, computing. And, and blockchain is always implemented in a distributed fashion. So there's no central database. So think of it as a shared ledger. So many people can have an identical copy. So if one is damaged or corrupted, it doesn't really matter. It's just replaced on the network. So that's a key feature. This is, and sometimes blockchain is called distributed ledger technology. And again, that's because uh, the distributed aspect is so uh, important. So the number two feature is transparency. And transparency is a choice in this technology. So I'll talk a little bit about, let's say, the Bitcoin blockchain, which is the most famous. Um, and, and that uh, blockchain is completely transparent. Anybody can download it. It's about 150 gigabytes. And you can see every single transaction. It's not encrypted or anything like that. It's just plain text uh, where you can see every single transaction uh, since 2009, the complete history. But that level of transparency is a choice that uh, the particular application um, has some, um, some leeway over. So the third aspect is crucial. And this is the idea of immutability. So if a blockchain is, uh, if you can rewrite history in a blockchain, it's not really a blockchain. So the idea is that this is a repository of the truth, if you want to think about it that way, uh, that nobody can go back in history and alter. So you can only add uh, to a blockchain. So if you make a mistake, uh, too bad. Uh, maybe you can do another entry to undo the mistake, but the mistake is going to live there uh, forever. So mutability is a, is a key property. And, and the last one is kind of the reason that is called blockchain. So I've got a little graphic below that shows that the data is not in a giant ledger. It's in separate sheets, if I could use the, the Excel terminology. And so those are the blocks. So the sheets are the blocks. And then the special idea, I think, uh, is the connection of these blocks. So notice in this graphic, the very last line of one block is repeated in the first line of the next block. And we'll go into more detail about that, but that is the chain aspect. So you're adding these blocks uh, to a blockchain, and uh, each of the blocks is connected uh, to the previous block. And I will talk about why I call this cryptographically secured. Um, and it, it turns out that the, the link is, uh, is uh, you know, deeply based in cryptography. So let's uh, kind of continue uh, with blockchain basics. And there are basically two things um, that make this special. So one is the verification of ownership. So if we've got a history of the ownership of something, and it could be goods, it could be services, uh, it's very general. Um, we can just check this blockchain. We're confident that nobody's messed with the history. So we can actually instantly verify if somebody owns something. So this is very secure, it's instant, and it's something that we can trust. So the verification ownership is very important. The second thing is the efficient exchange of ownership. So, so this is uh, an idea, it's a peer-to-peer -peer idea where everybody with this technology is treated equally. There's no distinction between a customer, a retailer, or a banker. Uh, there's no middle person either. This is a 
blockchain that you're interacting with. There is a computer program that is, is operating in the background, um, but no one directly controls that program if it's a public blockchain. And I need to tell you a little more detail about public and private uh, blockchain. So there's many applications here, and uh, this is an application on the next slide of verification of ownership. So think of getting into your car and doing a scan or a thumbprint, fingerprint, and uh, a blockchain is checked to make sure that you own the car. If you own the car, the car starts. So this is a very general idea. So it could be, uh, it could be your house, uh, it could be um, an Airbnb uh, where, you, where you get ownership for only a particular uh, time span. It's a very general idea. But there's even a deeper uh, possibility here. Suppose that you bought the car but had a loan from the bank. And that loan specified that if you miss three monthly payments in a row, you're in default. You get into the car, uh, you do the scan, you have not um, paid your loan in three months, the blockchain is checked, and the car does not start. So that is an example of what we call a smart contract. And indeed, the car would start for the bank. So it, it's, it's a kind of an extreme example, but you kind of get the idea that there's a lot of possibilities uh, with this uh, technology. Okay, so uh, the places that are most likely to be disrupted with blockchain technology are places where there's a thick layer of middle people. And this is true for any peer-to-peer -peer, uh, technology. So, so think uh, of a thick layer of middle people such as, in my area, banking. So bankers are the ultimate middle people, uh, taking a piece of the loan, the deposit, uh, the credit card fees. They, they are most at risk uh, from this technology, and they all know that their time, given their current business model, um, is, is numbered. So um, let me distinguish between um, public and, and private blockchains. So a public blockchain is a trustless blockchain. So there's many people that share a common ledger. Um, there's code that underlies this ledger that's open source. Anybody can actually see it. Um, it's trustless in that it doesn't really matter who the people are that uh, have a copy of the ledger. So in the current banking system, you need a lot of trust. You need to trust uh, your local bank that they won't take all your money. Um, you need to trust the Federal Reserve. Uh, in this public blockchain system, you don't really need to trust anybody. It's kind of the majority of the network uh, rules. Um, and there's certain um, codified uh, rules in the original source code that will be important. Um, let me mention also that uh, within blockchain technology, you can actually not just have data, uh, for example, verification of ownership, but you can have contracting. Like the example I gave with the car not starting um, if you're in default of the actual um, auto loan. So uh, it's possible to run very small computer programs, and that's what Ethereum does in their blockchain. So Ethereum's blockchain is much different than, let's say, the Bitcoin blockchain in that it allows for computer programs to be run. It allows for the, the, their blockchain to actually go out and seek some data um, that would be used as an input into a computer program. And indeed, most of the business applications today are Ethereum-based. Uh, so a private blockchain is sometimes called a permissioned uh, blockchain and sometimes not even called a blockchain. So it's called a distributed ledger. And here is a situation where trust is required. So for example, um, 
I'm not sure when, but uh, likely in the future, we will eliminate paper currency and the Federal Reserve and most central banks will have their own crypto um, national uh, currency. Kind of makes sense that paper currency uh, is, will be something of the past. Uh, so, so that will be a, a private a blockchain. And you can imagine the 12 um, uh, Federal Reserve banks uh, being permissioned to write um, transactions to that particular blockchain. So it's not wide open uh, like uh, other blockchains are today. So trust is required. And, and this is very important because you've probably seen a lot of blockchain applications. And one of the questions that I have immediately is, is this public or private? And if it is public, uh, is there a good reason to be public. So there is a cost to having um, this trustless uh, public sort of um, implementation. And often companies make a mistake in, in going with a, a public implementation when it's much more efficient to do something with, uh, uh, with some, uh, some trust. Okay, so let me get into the technology and then we'll jump uh, to the marketing uh, aspects. So the one technical thing that we have to cover today is cryptographic hashing. So let me give a simple example of a hash and then I'll do a more detailed example. So I want to send an email to Danielle. Uh, but uh, both of us are worried that the email might be intercepted and corrupted. So we come up with a scheme, and it's a very simple hashing scheme. The email is super simple. It's a single word, hello. Um, so what we're going to do, we'll agree upon this. We'll turn the letters into numbers, so A equals 1, B equals 2, dot, dot, dot. Um, and the hello turns into 8, 5, 12, 12, 15. And then our hashing routine will multiply all those numbers together. So you get 86,400. So I send the email to Danielle, then I post the hash on my website. So after Danielle gets my email, um, what she does is goes out to my website and sees the number 86,400. She does the hash on the word hello and gets 86,400. And therefore, um, we believe that it was securely uh, sent. So if it was corrupted, like uh, hello, H-A-L-L-O, then when Danielle does the hash, she gets 17,280, which doesn't match the original. So then we have to try again or maybe a different way to do this. So this is a really super simple uh, hashing algorithm, but it's, it's problematic um, because it – Basically, you can have two different um, versions of the message having the same hash. So for example, suppose somebody uh, corrupted the message and made a subtle change, but not so subtle in the meeting. So hello gets changed to oh hell. So it's a definitely a different meaning, and it's the same hash. This is technically called a collision. So we want to avoid collisions. And what I like to do is to jump out uh, to the internet to show you um, the kind of state-of-the-art hashing algorithm. It's called a, a SHA-256, Secure Hashing Algorithm. That's what SHA stands for. Um, this is a one-way function, and that's very important. So it basically produces 256 bits no matter how big the input is. And it's not meant to go the other way. So the, the people often call this encryption. No, no, no. Encryption is where you take a document, you encrypt it with a key, and then the key decrypts the document. This is not encryption. This is a one-way cryptographic function that is not meant uh, for de decryption. So let me, um, let me share going to work, um, a screen, 
and uh, hopefully you can see this, that this is a SHA-256 calculator. It's on the Internet. There's hundreds of these on the Internet that are available. Uh, I've typed in hello world here, and I'm going to calculate the hash. It's not going to be 256 bits because that's hard for you to see. We'll simplify it and uh, put it in um, uh, hexadecimal notation, which is the number 0 through 9 plus the first six letters of the alphabet. So when I do this, you can see that the hash below is 315F5. So let me just change this a bit. So I put a zero after hello world. Notice the hash is completely different. 312 or 1312AF. And if I go back to where I started, I get the 315F. So this is deterministic. And the last one I'll do is I'll put a larger number, 4250. Notice this one is a little unusual. Uh, the first four uh, entries are zeros. So it's kind of rare. Uh, the probability of getting a zero is 1 over 16. Remember, 0 through 9 in the first six letters of the alphabet. So 1 over 16 times 1 over 16 uh, times 1 over 16 times 1 over 16. So that's kind of a large number. So if you were kind of cycling through numbers to try to find these leading zeros, that, uh, that would be challenging. So let me kind of hop back uh, to the presentation. And, and now um, think about uh, sending the email uh, to Danielle. Um, what we would do is I would take my message, I would do a SHA-256, post that on my website, send the message to Danielle. She uses the same tool. She looks at the hash, makes sure it matches um, what's on my website, and we're done. Okay, so we don't have this collision problem that we had with the simple one. Um, by the way, this is how email actually works. So this happens all the time, and I challenge you to go into your email header and look at the, the properties, the full header, and you can see reference to uh, SHA-256 and 384. 384 is just a, a longer version. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about uh, Bitcoin blockchain before we jump to the marketing uh, application, because it's important to kind of see how this uh, particular works. So um, this is the diagram that I showed you before. Okay, it's an identical diagram. Uh, before I didn't tell you what that last line was and the first line. Now I will. It's a SHA-256 hash. Okay, so that's, um, that's, that's important um, because we know that any small change in the input or the transactions will cause a totally different uh, SHA-256. So if we think about this, um, this is a simplified version of three blocks, 999, 1000, and 1001. Notice uh, that uh, the hash of uh, block 999, the 1DS, is the first line of block 1000, and then the block 1000th hash is the first line of 1001. So um, in block 1000, I do a transaction. So I buy a car from John and pay him 17 BTC. So you see the minus 17 and the plus 17 there. Now suppose that I do something nefarious. I go into one of these ledgers and I make a subtle change. Hopefully you can see it, that I just flip the sign between John and Cam. So now I get the car from John, but John pays me 17 BTC. Okay, so it's a nefarious action. And the problem with that, even though it's very subtle, the hash of that block will be completely different than the hash of, um, that's uh, represented in block 1001. So given that it doesn't match, uh, the network sees that this is invalid and immediately throws out this block and replaces it with what is agreed upon in the network. So to go to a, uh, a particular implementation of the ledger, make a change, uh, is, is really a futile uh, task. So there's one last thing that I need to mention. 
and that is that the SHA-256 that is the last line of the block and the first line is not a simple SHA-256, and, uh, which I, I showed you how to do. It's very, very easy to do. It turns out that what happens is we take all the transactions in that block, and then we do the SHA-56, um, and then we start appending uh, a number, which is called a nonce. We just keep on cycling, one, two, three, four, and doing uh, SHA-56 on, on these transactions until we get a certain number of leading zeros. Okay, so this is um, what the so-called miners do. And they will try billions and trillions of different numbers trying to get um, a very special uh, SHA-256 that's got a lot of leading zeros. So uh, this is the so-called work um, that is done in the Bitcoin blockchain. It's very important because you might have figured this out already that if it was the case that it was just a really simple um, SHA-256, then you, could pr you might be able to work your way back in time and make changes uh, to a uh, blockchain. But today, the technology is such that there's a massive amount of computing finding a very rare hash. And that hash has got 18 leading zeros. And the difficulty of getting that is the equivalent of winning the Powerball lottery twice in a row. So it makes it, it makes it technically infeasible to go back in time to change the ledger. So the ledger has got unprecedented uh, security around it. Okay, so let's, um, let's kind of jump uh, ahead um, to the marketing uh, implications. So again, I, want, I want lots of uh, time for questions. So this is what I would like to challenge you to think about. Uh, what does the world look like when they're near zero transactions costs? I mean, today, there's plenty of transactions costs. And, and probably the worst example is a credit card, where the retailer's got to pay 3%, a gas station, I think, is 7%. So uh, what if there's near zero transactions costs? And also, um, I want you to think about the layer of middle people uh, being dramatically reduced. So in the short term, there will be a thinner layer of companies that, uh, that will be doing uh, essentially the job of the previous uh, middle people. But in the future, we'll have new middle people that are what I call DAOs. Um, and these are distributed autonomous organizations. An example of this is, for example, the code that runs Bitcoin and the code that runs Ethereum. Uh, the code is actually effectively employing people. So uh, there's really um, no cost um, in, involved in terms of head office or or things that we usually associate with a corporation. It's simply a computer program. And, and the last thing that I'll, I'll talk about uh, a little later that's crucial is the ability for individuals to own and control their data. So I believe we're moving in that direction. However, it's just not, we're not there yet. So, so I think of the Internet in three stages. So the first stage was right at the beginning where it was purely a way to gather information. So think of one of the first websites was nytimes.com. Essentially, they took their newspaper content and just posted it online so people could see it on the Internet rather than actually physically buying uh, the newspaper. Wikipedia is another good example of that. The second wave is social media, where uh, Instagram, you know, Facebook, Twitter, things like that, where communities were established that we could never have in the old model, where at best you could be close to 100 people, and now some people have millions uh, of, of followers. So that's kind of the second stage. Um, 
I believe the third stage is what I call machine to machine payments um, enabled by the internet. Okay, so let's talk about payments on the internet. So the internet's great, but for payments, it is very clunky. So, so think about making a payment. Uh, you need to enter credit card information, or even worse, uh, bank account information. Uh, it, it seems like every few weeks, a major um, company that we, I guess, thought we trusted, um, loses the credit card uh, information to hackers. Okay, so it's not secure. It's uh, it's expensive. So merchants pay three percent. Um, and also, uh, payments have to be of a sufficient size. So there's no way to do a credit card payment for $0.10 cents or $0.25. Cents. And, um, and to do this, you need to be banked. So you need to have a bank account. And uh, there are 2.5 billion people in the world that are unbanked uh, right now. So uh, it's also the case that uh, you can pay for stuff with a credit card or a debit card, but uh, you can't be paid. So there's a few exceptions here, like Amazon Turk, um, where you can do some tasks and be paid, but that only applies to people that live in the U.S. and India, and you get paid once a month. So, so what I want you to be thinking about is the ability to pay, to be paid, uh, and it doesn't matter any amount, instantly and securely. So that's where we're heading, and this is enabled with blockchain technology. And this is another interesting uh, thing, that when um, the World Wide Web was first introduced around 1994, 1995, uh, it turns out that the HTTP protocol um, included a provision for digital cash. So it's the so-called 402. I know you've had a 402 or, or 404 error, which is website um, not found, but 402 is a very inter interesting provision in that this was originally put up for uh, digital payments, and indeed there was a lot of research in the early 1980s um, and throughout the 80s on digital currency. It turns out that every single initiative failed and uh, it was never implemented, but it, the infrastructure exists today for uh, digital payments on the internet using this protocol, and blockchain technology is exactly what we need to make that happen. Indeed, the, the digital currencies of the past failed uh, for kind of simple intuition that digital can be copied. So if you've got a photo, uh, a movie, a song, uh, you can make an exact copy digitally. So with currency, it's the perfect way to do counterfeiting. So what blockchain does, think of it in the currency application, is taking the serial number very seriously and having a record of every single uh, transaction. So 402 is available and a number of firms are working on implementations so that there's instant payment and uh, and or you can pay and very, very, very low uh, transactions costs. So I tell this uh, story to my students that you could uh, think about hopping in an Uber to go downtown to meet up at a restaurant. Uh, you get into the Uber and uh, you pull out your smartphone and do a couple of surveys. And for each survey you get paid uh, a couple of dollars and that's enough to pay for the Uber. So, so tasks like that are feasible to do, and essentially it monetizes some, some human uh, capital. So another way to think about this is uh, email. So uh, right now, um, at the top of your inbox, you want things from your family, friends, and work. But uh, there's a lot of companies that would really like to get to the top of your inbox. So they're willing to pay for it. So think about a different system where you set the price to get to the number one slot in your inbox. And indeed, if you open the email, maybe you're paid also. Or you click on the link, you're paid. So all of these are possibilities with this technology. 
So uh, indeed, um, I'll talk a little bit about this idea of personalized pricing also. This allows companies to, to basically um, tailor a price uh, for a good to you. There's a common price, but there's effectively rebates that are given depending upon your characteristics. So in my world of the future, email is no longer free. There's a small fee that's associated with every single email. So it doesn't matter if it's coming from your family or friends. They have to pay to get to your inbox, but it's a very small fee, like a tenth of a cent. So if you do that, um, spam is gone. And I'm sure most of you realize that, uh, well, I know for a fact, at Duke right now, um, at duke.edu, 60% uh, of all of the emails never go to an inbox. So they never go to a junk folder or anything like that. They're just quarantined. They're gone. Um, so, so this would obviously free up a lot of bandwidth, um, but uh, this is definitely where we're going, and blockchain technology uh, makes this possible. So email can be abused because it's free by spammers. The same thing with the Internet, that we should be paying a very small fee to visit uh, whatever website. Um, this also puts out a business of people doing denial of service uh, attacks. So, so now uh, if we've got this model with uh, email that you can actually uh, set uh, a price on um, to get into your inbox, if we could have a situation where uh, the Internet is also um, paid for, it opens up a lot of possibilities. So this is something that is close to your, um, your home, and this has to do with online advertising. And it's no surprise to you that Google and Facebook um, are essentially a duopoly in digital advertising right now. So that 77% in 2017 is the total. If you look at kind of new uh, online advertising, you know it's more like 90% uh, Google and Facebook. So how does that work? Um, well, essentially, Google and Facebook are harvesting information about you and essentially selling that information to firms um, so that they could uh, promote the, the goods. So it's probabilistic information that they're harvesting. And uh, I like to use in my course um, uh, Google uh, AdWords. So, and, and some of these AdWords are extraordinarily uh, expensive. I list up here. Then the number two is the search for Dallas truck accident lawyer. And um, that search uh, results in $425.70 that the, um, the lawyer pays to Google. So in my model of uh, the future, uh, that duopoly no longer uh, will exist. So I believe that um, consumers uh, will be able to control their own profile. So, so think of uh, putting not a probabilistic profile, but um, putting up a, a profile that's accurate, that's instantly scraped, that it might be uh, pretty well in real time. So it could be you give uh, your own demographic <clears throat> information. You um, might say, um, I'm looking for a new car. This is what I have right now. And this is the price range, and um, and maybe this is the style. And then all of a sudden, what shows up in your inbox directly from uh, the manufacturers uh, are are things like uh, five hundred dollars if you come to the uh, the showroom, or two hundred dollars to open this email, and a hundred dollars to click through. Um, this particular, what this car is offering. And it might not be a car. It could be something more subtle. I'm going to Chicago for a conference. I'm looking for a hotel. And, and essentially, what you're doing is disrupting uh, Google AdWords. So you are going to own, you're going to control, you're going to monetize um, your own information. 
And yeah, that's true that uh, Google makes about $100 a, a person uh, in, in doing this uh, in the world. It doesn't seem like that much. But I tell my students that you shouldn't think of the average, that they're probably worth uh, $5,000 to $10,000 a year in, in, in terms of their profile. So this is a large uh, transfer from uh, Google and Facebook to, uh, to the consumers. And, and, and think Facebook and, and Google also have all this great content. So YouTube videos, Facebook videos, uh, yeah, think of uh, what happens. Like your kid does a really cool uh, video for, for middle school and uh, it goes viral and gets 5 million uh, views. So your kid gets nothing. You get nothing. But if it was the case that you could monetize that, even at one cent a click, that's a huge amount of money. That's a year of tuition uh, and potentially more um, that, that could be monetized. So this allows for the monetization of the content that people create. Right now, you're able to get a little bit from YouTube, but it's just nowhere near what people uh, should get. So, so this idea of these micro payments, so think of with no transactions costs, payments are, can come in real time. So, so think uh, of a different model uh, for many businesses. So, so people, uh, instead of owning AT&T stock, they own a piece of a cell phone tower maybe 10% of it. You drive by, you use that tower, there's a micropayment that's instantly made to that tower, then a micropayment that's instantly made to you as an investor in that tower. So, so all of these, there's so many possibilities here um, to actually harvest this uh, micropayments um, for various different things that could be extremely um, effective. So there's, there's uh, you know, it's kind of the modern version of, of coupons, but it is uh, done in real time very securely. So I believe that there's a lot of possibilities um, in marketing. Um, and let me uh, finish up because I want time for, for questions. And uh, people always ask me, well, what's going to happen in 2018? Uh, we um, are seeing a lot of movement um, in terms of uh, very quick and cheap transactions. So right now, for example, in the Bitcoin blockchain, there is a transaction fee that was actually kind of large, but a new technology called Level 2 uh, for these blockchains has allowed for extremely low uh, transactions costs. Uh, I think we'll also see some blockchain-enabled uh, databases, um, both cloud databases and um, and uh, IPFS, for example, and also a lot of progress on the Internet of Things. Internet of Things is a real problem because people can hack into the um, into these devices. So, so I think that we will see uh, that that progress. So, um, let me kind of finish up there because I'd, I'd like to take some questions, and I see questions um, um, popping up uh, already. So. Um, let me let me um, answer. Actually, Hamid's got a couple of questions that I see. What about fraud? Uh, this, is, this is a great question. Um, so people uh, hear about Bitcoin being stolen and stuff like that. This has nothing to do with blockchain. So with Bitcoin, um, you get a private key that allows you to spend the Bitcoin. So ideally, you keep that key to yourself and have a backup, even like a paper copy of it, so you don't um, lose it. But some people uh, trust um, uh, shady you know, uh, uh, you know, offshore banks to hold their keys. Those banks are hacked, and you lose your key. So, so yeah, um, somebody can hack into a third party and, and steal uh, some stuff that, that, uh, that you put there. So that's nothing new. It's like a bank robbery. 
So in, in terms of more general fraud, uh, this technology substantially eliminates it. So, so think of spending, so it would be incredibly difficult um, for you to, let's say you, you steal somebody's cell phone, it's got uh, your, like some ability to spend, but you need to produce a thumbprint or a, a scan to actually do that spending. So that, that's pretty secure. It's way more secure than the credit cards uh, today. So the, the last thing I'll say on the fraud and this is very important. Um, these ledgers are, are open. So it, for a criminal to extort Bitcoin, it, it basically shows the criminal doesn't understand the technology because all the transactions are transparent. So you might be able to get it anonymously, but as soon as you try to get it out um, and sell it on an exchange, then people can figure out who you are. So, so actually, I think that it substantially uh, reduces uh, fraud. Um, in terms of, uh, Ralph asked, when are these changes coming forth? So it is a big mistake to assume that, oh, well, this is 10 years away. Uh, you're just going to be wrong. Um, this is happening in real time. Uh, that uh, look at what's happened just with the first wave of cryptocurrencies where just out of thin air, we've got uh, $400 billion uh, of value there. There's many firms that have teams working on this technology. If I go to a company and ask them about uh, their blockchain team, if they say, oh, well, we're exploring the idea or we're experimenting with the idea, uh, that, that to me means that they, um, they're not taking it seriously. So what I want to hear is, you know, we have a dedicated team on this. We understand that this is a, both a threat to our current business, but if we're in fast enough, this could be a big opportunity to be the leader. That's what I want to hear. And I want to hear that, uh, and that kind of validates that, okay, this is a disruption that's going to affect many things. So it's not just finance and marketing, as we've talked about, but operations, supply chain, accounting, how we keep records of financial statements. There's so many uh, possibilities here. So if you're experimenting, nope, that's just not good enough. Um, the consultants just love this. Um, they have invested a huge amount in terms of developing blockchain expertise. They will come into your, your company and suggest where you can save implementing a blockchain technology. For example, one of the low-hanging fruit is so-called back office sort of activities where transactions are kind of verified within your firm. Um, whatever suppliers that you use, that I would not want a job in a back office. That sort of job is going to be disrupted uh, by blockchain uh, technology. Um, there's also um, a good question on privacy. So um, again, privacy is a choice. So for example, one talked about uh, implementation of blockchain is for voting. Um, but if the blockchain is public, then you see how everybody votes. And that's, that's a non-starter. So there are ways to do this. Um, so it's called a zero-knowledge proof. There are ways to do this so that you can uh, be verified that you have the right to vote, and then you vote, but people don't actually know who you are. So, so that it substantially deals with the, uh, the privacy uh, issue. So again, it largely depends upon the choice in implementing uh, the actual um, uh, blockchain. So um, there's a question on what sectors are the first. Um, so I actually think that uh, probably uh, we've already seen finance, so finance has moved first. Um, most of the big banks are, are scrambling uh, to try to figure out how to deal uh, with this particular uh, technology. Uh, that's probably the first to go. Um, the, I believe, and this is not a, a sector, but more a specialization, I believe that we're going to see something happen 
substantially in 2018 uh, in the marketing area where um, advertisers kind of figure this out that this is like an existential threat to the way that they're doing uh, their business. And we'll see some adoption of this technology uh, in, in, um, in the marketing field. Uh, I think we'll also see a number of supply chain uh, applications. It, it is just, you look at, for example, these food recalls where uh, romaine lettuce, uh, you know, throw it out uh, you know, across the entire U.S. where um, it's very specialized to a particular uh, farm. And if there was blockchain supply chain, you would know exactly where that lettuce went. So the recall could be very uh, specialized. Um, Michael's got a good question on mining. So, um, and thank you for asking that question. Um, I gave an example of Bitcoin, and in Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin's uh, uh, blockchain technology relies upon the having a very rare hash. Uh, linking one block to another. And that's where all the computing power comes in. And gee, the amount of computing, um, just the energy requirement would make the Bitcoin blockchain uh, computing uh, array the 61st largest country in the world in terms of energy uh, consumption. So that is a choice that Bitcoin made. So you can have another choice. So it might be that you have uh, people verifying transactions and adding blocks that um, are incented to do it in the right way. It's, it's called proof of stake. So, so think of it this way, that um, you've got a large amount of the underlying currency, for example. Uh, you're designated to verify and add a block. Um, and you're not going to do anything nefarious because it's going to affect uh, the the value of your stake. Indeed, you might have to put escrow up to actually do it. There's many different ways to do this. And in the private blockchains, um, you don't need the energy, you don't need the mining. Um, there's only permission people. And, it, and, and again, I want to emphasize, you can have a blockchain that has no cryptocurrency. People make this mistake all the time, thinking, oh, there's got to be mining, there's got to be uh, a cryptocurrency. No, that is a choice in this technology. So you do not need uh, a crypto. Uh, currency. So uh, Amit asks about uh, Ethereum-enabled um, contracts, and I did give an example of this, a simple example uh, where if there's a condition that's met, then there is a payment um, that's made. So that's a very simple contract. Uh, it could be more complicated, um, but um, these are, are very simple to actually implement in Ethereum. The one thing that I will mention, and, and I'm actually bullish on the lawyers because um, they, they have a new role. So I, I, I know it was mentioned at the beginning that over half the uh, class of 2018 at the business school took uh, my blockchain course. I should also give a hat tip to our law school that has got a blockchain course because they see that these smart contracts are going to be the thing of the future uh, in terms of uh, law. So the one thing that's super important is once that contract is in the Ethereum blockchain, it is there forever. So it cannot be changed. So you need to get it right. Um, so um, let me, uh, let me continue with these. Uh, man, there's a lot of uh, questions that have come up. Um, so John asked this great question, um, and it's a very good question, more general than his question. And basically saying, well, um, Google and Facebook make so much money off of uh, the, the advertising. Will they do something with that money to try, try to prevent the disruption of blockchain? And uh, the answer uh, is probably yes, uh, but they're not the only ones. So any time there is a thick layer of middle people, those middle people are going to want to resist the change. So it's not just Google and Facebook, but think of uh, other applications that are, um, for example, um, digital music. It is super interesting. We have a whole course on digital music uh, in the law school, and the the number 
of middle people is just enormous. Uh, and all of those people have an incentive to make sure that blockchain doesn't disrupt uh, digital music. And indeed, I think that digital music will be one of the last um, to transform because the, the force is so strong to resist. Uh, even in my own field, and, and you might not know this, but it is just striking to me that in 1920s to uh, settle a stock transaction, it took five days. And today, and when I talk about settling, I mean exchange ownership of the actual shares. Today it takes three days. Like, why? And the only reason why is that the thick layer of middle people uh, make money off of this. Europe is way ahead of us. It's two days. But two days, it doesn't make any sense. It should be two minutes. And blockchain technology allows this um, to, uh, to, to basically greatly uh, reduce the time. So uh, there's a good question from Donald about um, what about these companies uh, in this technology? Is it the fact that they're just going to go out of business? So again, let me emphasize that um, there are some firms that will go out of business. For example, a firm that does title insurance. So you buy a house, get a mortgage, you have to pay a premium to uh, a title insurer to protect the bank because the bank uh, is at risk if you're buying the house from somebody who doesn't really own it. So with blockchain technology, you consult the ledger, you establish that the person owns the house, you establish whatever liens are on the house, you're done. So title insurance is gone. So there are certain things to people in the middle. If you've got a business as a middle person, then yes, you will go out of business. But the vast majority of firms, they're are things that will become possible with this technology that initially allow them to substantially reduce their costs. And that's a good thing. So you can adopt this technology to reduce, uh, to reduce costs. Um, so that's a positive thing. There will be other situations where there could be challenges for the business model that the firm is actually engaged in. In those cases, you need to actually uh, think about pivoting. So given uh, the assets that you actually have, and it might be, who knows, like a customer list or something like that, what can you do um, with that information that's within your business line using blockchain technology that makes sure uh, that you survive? So there will be firms that go out of business. Uh, there will be firms that pivot. There will be firms that their business model means that they're smaller. And there will be other firms that become much larger and leaders uh, in this particular um, uh, technology. Um, David's got a great question about, you know, what about, how, how do we get this? How do we get the, how do we hire somebody to actually uh, do this? So, in, so I've got uh, a number of points to make here. The first thing is that you'd be surprised how easy it is to set up uh, a blockchain uh, technology. And the reason is that all of this code is open source. So, for example, uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, you can just download the code. It's done. And there's hundreds of other blockchain implementations where the code exists. So all you need to do is to find um, a smart programmer and they start by downloading somebody else's code and then just modifying it for the particular uh, use. Um, so. So this is kind of related to Anne's question on the intellectual uh, property. So given that blockchain is, uh, is open source for most of the applications, uh, th there's no particular intellectual property. There are some firms. Uh, it's kind of interesting to me the contrast between J.P. Morgan and Bank of America in my area. So J.P. Morgan, everything they're doing is open source. So any other bank can copy their blockchain implementation, uh, which is kind of radical compared to what we've seen in the past. Bank of America's different strategy. They're just filing patents on their blockchain implementations. I don't think um, the patents are defensible. 
And I think it's a bad strategy um, to go and think that you're going to have a special version that will be uh, proprietary. The idea is a general idea, and I think that you can adopt it uh, for the particular implementation. Um, so there is, uh, I guess, questions um, on kind of the implementation. People have heard that it takes 10 minutes to uh, verify a transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain. And that's not fast enough. So if you're at a store, uh, you're not going to wait 10 minutes to pay for something. So again, this is simply an example of one technology. Um, it is a choice. So how often the blocks are put into a blockchain. So in Bitcoin is 10 minutes, but you can have a private uh, blockchain or a public blockchain where the blocks are added every second. So it's completely up to the particular implementation. So you want speed, if speed's important, um, that's just not an issue that you can actually do this uh, and it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a choice that you actually have to um, deal with. So, so again, um, there are uh, very, very low transactions costs. So not transactions costs that we think of, uh, about in kind of the current uh, set of businesses. So usually we're thinking like a percent or 2% or 3% for credit cards. There are transactions costs because it, you have to reward people for uh, what they're doing to service this actual blockchain. But we're talking about, uh, you know, a, a hundredth of a percent. So very, very low uh, transactions costs. Um, so there's a question on uh, on ownership of data and 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 controllability of that. So, Amazon, Google, Facebook, all these firms, uh, they have they have probabilistically uh, your data. They could have much more data. So, Google um, indeed uh, was initially scraping uh, the Gmail headers. They could have been scraping the actual emails. So they could have had way more information, but they were just doing the headers. They don't do that anymore. Um, let me also say that one of the major forces here is not just blockchain, but the European Union. So m many of you probably know that the European Union Union's already um, figured this out, essentially, that uh, Google, Facebook have this monopoly over the data. And it's likely either in 2018 or early 2019, there will be some sort of ruling that makes it uh, essentially that they will have to share uh, the data. So we're not quite there yet in terms of setting up the sites that allow you to, um, to basically um, have your own uh, profile. Uh, there are companies like earn.com, uh, that you should probably take a look at. Uh, they've already implemented the paid for email and doing tasks um, where you're rewarded for, so that, uh, that exists uh, like right now. Um, so I've been asked about um, more uh, discussion in terms of uh, immutability. Let me just uh, briefly um, respond to, to one question. Yeah, immutability, that you might consider it a, a disadvantage in that you can't correct a mistake, but uh, in a way, the advantages outweigh the disadvantages. So um, it is true with this technology that it is set in stone. So uh, if there's a mistake, there's a mistake. That's it. And again, I mentioned earlier that you could do another transaction, but um, but uh, again, once it's there, it's it's actually uh, there. So uh, I guess we're kind of running out of time, but um, there are a number of questions about um, advertising and to talk a little more about that. So again, I think of advertising, and again, this is not my field, I'm afraid uh, it's obvious to, to all of you. Um, think about the traditional model of advertising. Many years ago, you took an ad out, like in a newspaper, <laughs> um, and that's just like blanketing everybody. Uh, very inefficient. So then um, 
there was some specialization so that different people read different publications, so you could kind of specialize maybe to a geographic area or uh, a broad demographic. Uh, and we've become more and more specialized. So now uh, there's a probabilistic profile, kind of know your search habits uh, and, um, and the sort of sites that you've gone to. So now there's an auction for your eyeballs, but it's just not very precise. So I indeed was at a conference in Chicago, I was searching for a hotel, and then just like weeks afterwards, all this Chicago stuff is served at me, and it's useless. Okay, so it's still very inefficient. So this technology uh, combined with your own social graph and social profile allows companies to go directly to you. And I think the advertising firms will have to adopt to this. Um, and, uh, and again, um, it, given the, the cost of the actual delivery of uh, digital advertising, it would be highly specialized um, so that even – um, something uh, people that uh, might not be the most valuable targets can be targeted now feasibly and for the stuff that they actually uh, need. So, so I see a really um, big disruption in terms of advertising where everything is very specialized down to the actual person. So it's not a probabilistic grouping. It is the person saying, this is what I'm interested in. So it's tailored directly. And this idea of a uh, of, of private pricing, you, of course, I have to have the same price for, for everybody uh, legally. But uh, essentially, once you identify that person, you can offer deals such that the price uh, becomes tailored to them. So blockchain technology uh, allows this to happen. So the secure uh, profile and then the actual ability to do these transactions where you pay and can be paid. So we've got a little over time. I really appreciate all of the questions. Um, uh, I will make sure that my uh, presentation is available to everybody. And I will also uh, provide a list of links uh, to my course material if you're interested in looking at that also. So uh, thank you. That's terrific. Thanks very much, Cam. We really